Good morning. Good to see all of you here. We have, for those who are watching on Facebook, we have the largest uh, gathering this morning that we've ever had here after a post-COVID. And so it's a blessing to see all of the faces here in the auditorium. They're all well spaced out. They're all wearing face masks. So, uh, so that's, that's very helpful. That, that allows us to continue to expand and grow. If we get many more people, we're going to start bringing in chairs for the back of the auditorium, and we uh, look forward to that opportunity to be able to do that. So I hear we had some problem with the audio this morning, um, and uh, uh, so I'm going to ask make, make sure that everybody here in the auditorium, if you, if you have it on your phone, don't do that. You don't need to hear me twice, okay? So uh, you can go ahead and uh, take, off your, take off your Facebook Live, except for uh, Alyssa here, who's our our technical advisor um, but uh, let us know about the audio um, believe me we have tried our best to figure out um, how to do this perfectly and uh, and uh, electronics is not always cooperating with us so um, we really appreciate that it's interesting that we have the largest audience that we have today and yet you see that I'm wearing a mask today because that's our new policy the uh, county of st. Louis has advised required really that Anybody indoors wear a mask, and uh, our um, advisory team that really keeps up with all of the COVID stuff uh, had a conversation and said, really, that needs to extend beyond those people who are sitting in the pew to include those who are up front here. So it's a little challenge for us. It's, I know it's probably a challenge for you as well, because you're used to seeing our whole face. But uh, for some of us, that may be a blessing for you, that you don't get to see everything. But um, but we would like your feedback about this. Now, I, I guarantee you, anything that we do is going to be less than ideal, but we're already used to less than ideal. We're trying to make uh, best of, the, of the, the limitations that we are, we're forced to, um, to, uh, to uh, apply to our church gatherings. But there are other options that we can consider. None of them are, um, all of them come with their own problems. But we would like uh, your uh, feedback, not during worship, just, you know, just enjoy worship. But afterwards, give us some feedback about whether this was uh, overly distracting, whether it, it was something you could live with, whether we should look at other options, all that stuff. Uh, we, would, uh, we would love to hear from you. Um, we have a great worship service plan today. John will be, um, will be leading our singing, and uh, he, uh, along with several others who are singing here today, uh, and our whole gathering that's full voice, and I know that the church probably is able to hear a lot of that. I was going to put up faces, a picture of John up here so you can see what his face looks like, and uh, I know uh, Steve Klosky is going to be uh, leading our communion and sharing our shepherd's prayer. Maybe you know what Steve looks like. And uh, myself, you're probably tired of seeing me anyway. So uh, join in today and worship with us. And we are so thankful that you're part of this gathering.
you if you have ever been in a position where you have been so mistreated and so persecuted and so verbally abused by someone close to you a stranger or perhaps acquaintance and within your heart and within your mind you possess the power to forgive them And then they came and they asked you for that forgiveness. They were cruel. They were hurtful. They wounded you deeply. And only you had the power to forgive them. In his volume, The Sunflower, by Simon Wiesenthal. He relates a story while he was a prisoner in a concentration camp. One day on his work detail, he was plucked from the group of men and was asked to attend to a dying Nazi SS soldier. He had no idea what it was going to be about. He only knew that he had no choice in the matter. He was going to have to spend time with this young man. Wiesenthal records and relates what happened. I want to read briefly. I noticed that the dying man had a warm undertone in his voice as he spoke about the Jews. I had never heard such a tone in the voice of an SS man. Was he better than the others? Or did the voices of SS men change when they were dying? An order was given, he continued, and we marched toward the huddled masses of Jews. There were 150 of them, or perhaps 200 including many children who stared at us with anxious eyes. A few were quietly crying. There were infants in their mother's arms, but hardly any young men, mostly women and gray beards. As we approached, I could see the expression in their eyes, fear indescribable fear. Apparently, they knew what was awaiting them.
I know that what I have told you is terrible. In the long nights while I have been waiting for death time and time again, I have longed to talk about it to a Jew and beg forgiveness. Only I didn't know whether there were any Jews left. I know that what I'm asking is almost too much for you, but without your answer, I cannot die in peace. Now there was an uncanny silence in the room. At last I'd made up my mind, and without a word, I left the room. I left the room without a word to this 22-year-old Nazi SS guy. Simon Wiesenthal experienced that in his life. How does that relate to us? Go back to the question that I'd ask. If you've ever been in a position where it solely was in your power to forgive somebody who had done such harm to you. That you had the power to forgive them. I've never experienced that. And I do not know if I would leave the room silently. In Genesis chapter 50, a very familiar ending to a very familiar story. I'm going to read just part of it. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph, saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. And when their message came to him, Joseph wept. You know the end of the story. We take this supper to celebrate the death of Christ. Not because of the pain and agony he suffered, but because it gives us forgiveness for the sins that we have committed against him, his father, his spirit. It's not just routine, folks. It is an intensely private moment between you and your Savior. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, for the life, for the love, and for the death of your Son. We are mesmerized by what it took for us to be saved and put into a righteous relationship with you. May we never forget the forgiveness we receive because of his body and his blood on his cross. And we celebrate his resurrection that confirms to us the credibility of our forgiveness. As we participate in this feast, may we recall all that he taught and all that he gave. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
boundless love, unending joy. This is my life. It's what I know, and I can't believe that He selected me, Jesus, my Lord. It's You I owe, and I can't believe that He selected me, Jesus, my Lord. It's You I owe. one of my favorite hymns of the modern era and I thank John for leading that this morning it really ties in well with my message today this past week Don Lemon a commentator and news reporter on CNN in an interview that he had really about the uh, political leaders of ancient of uh, the the early political leaders in our country and uh, the whole uh, discussion about statues about them shared this interesting comment. You may have heard it, you may not have, but I'll read it to you. Quote, Jesus Christ, if that's who you believe in, Jesus Christ admittedly was not perfect when he was here on this earth. So why are we deifying the founders of this country, many of whom own slaves? I said it was interesting because there were two opposite reactions uh, to that comment. One was shock and amazement that someone would have the audacity to say that Jesus wasn't perfect. Not just to say it, but to communicate that it was a truth that was so widely accepted that it would be said that it was admittedly true. 
The words heretical and blasphemous were leveled at Don Lemon for those comments. Tony Dungy, the the coach, says this, I'm sorry, Mr. Lemon, but just who admitted that Jesus Christ was not perfect here on earth? Not anyone who believes in the Bible. That may have been your response to this comment, as you heard it today or maybe heard it on the news this past week. But it's not the only response that was heard. Others were surprised that it was that big of a deal that people would get in that much uproar for something that Don Lemon said that they feel was obviously true and so widely accepted that no one in their right mind would question the fact that Jesus sinned even a little during his lifetime. Now, I'm not here to bash Don Lemon. I'm assuming that he's speaking those words from a a secular worldview. He probably sees Jesus as equal to people like Mahatma Gandhi or uh, Martin Luther King Jr. All of them strove to be righteous, but nobody would ever claim that those two gentlemen were perfect in what they did. Before you think, well, no one in church would make such a claim, I'd like you to note this. In a recent article by Arizona Christian University, 44% of the respondents said that they believed that while on earth, Jesus committed some sins just like everyone else does. Some Christians may even wonder why the answer to the question makes any difference at all. So what if Jesus wasn't perfect? He was still good and therefore deserves our honor and respect. Okay, I want to put aside the political discussion. All this happens in a political environment, you know, and all this stuff is clickbait for people that surf the internet. But I would take, I would like to take a few minutes this morning to ask the questions and explore whether Jesus really was a sinless person and why the answer to that question makes all the difference in the world. Let's begin by addressing Lemon's claim that the fallibility of Jesus is something that's admittedly true. So what is it? Is it, is it the claim of the, of the sinless Jesus just a fable that had been passed on through the generations? Or is it something that was affirmed by the earliest Christians who knew and lived with Jesus? Well, the best witnesses are going to be those who, who walked with him. And several of those wrote in the New Testament, wrote their memories of Jesus there. The 12 disciples primarily spent three years with Jesus in his ministry. People like Peter, who later on shared this comment, Jesus committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. Or John, the apostle John, who said that Jesus came to take away our sins and there is no sin in him. Now that's just a couple of the reports of witnesses who lived with Jesus, but But the whole tenor of all the reports in Scripture is that Jesus really did live a life without committing sin. The most vivid portrait of that has to be the story that's reported in three of the gospel accounts of when Satan unleashed every um, tool that he had in his arsenal to try to convince Jesus to motivate him to commit sin. After Jesus was gone into the wilderness for a time of retreat, he had gone without food for 40 days while he was there, and Satan showed up. And he asked him, why don't you're hungry, why don't you turn these stones into bread? The offer sounds pretty innocuous, doesn't it? And really, it makes perfect sense, considering the circumstances, Jesus definitely was hungry. But Jesus knew that the request had nothing to do with providing food for a hungry person and had everything to do with challenging the authority of God in the life of Jesus. And so Jesus responded to Satan with these words, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Satan wasn't through. He took Jesus to the high pinnacle of the temple and he asked him to prove his authenticity by jumping off the highest point in the temple because if he really was who he claimed to be, surely God's angels would not let him crash down to the rocky ground below and die there. But Jesus again refused and he said this, do not test God. Finally, Satan shows Jesus 
all the riches and the wealth and the power in the world. And he says, I have the authority to give all of this to you if you will simply worship me instead of your father. But even when the offer was sweetened by the wealth of all of the universe, Jesus responded and says this, Satan, get behind me. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Now, this wasn't the only time Satan tested and tempted Jesus in his lifetime, I'm sure, but this story is included in all the gospel accounts except for John to show us that when tested with the most powerful temptations that we could imagine, Jesus stood firm in his allegiance to God. So contrary to Lemon's assertion, the only belief that the earliest witnesses admitted to was that Jesus lived a sinless life. And some may ask, well, why is this such a crucial belief in Christianity? Why did the gospel writers go out of their way to show that Jesus lived a sinless life? And why, if we give up that belief, does the whole story of Jesus lose its power and its value? First, Jesus had to be perfect if he was who he claimed to be. One of the reasons people assume that Jesus had to have sinned sometime during his lifetime is because no one can live a sinless life. I mean, it's just humanly impossible, right? And if Jesus was just a human, even if he was the most exemplary human to ever live, he would have sinned. I mean, even just a little. But those who knew Jesus the best declared without question that Jesus was not just human. Jesus was God in the form of humanity. From his virgin birth to his baptism to the display of his miracles to his resurrection, Jesus showed himself to be deity, God dressed up in the body and the skin of a human being. The Apostle John voiced this with beautiful poetic language in his gospel account when he begins it using a, a metaphor to describe Jesus, calling him the Word. And here's what he says. Listen to this. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. And because Jesus was God, he was holy in all he did. Now this is a crucial point, so you, you really have to take this in. You can't have it both ways. If Jesus was deity, he had to display the character of deity. If he sinned, he was just another noble teacher, but very, very human. It's natural for us to respect those who exemplify the best among us, the, the most noble characters of people that have walked the earth, but we only worship the one who showed himself to be God. But why was that even necessary for, for God to come to earth as a human being? I mean, God is worked his message and his will through humans throughout all of history from Abraham and Moses to Mary. Why couldn't he just delegate this task? And this is the second crucial point that you need to know. Jesus had to be perfect in order to provide forgiveness to a sinful humanity. Scripture reminds us of something that we all already know, that everyone sins. But what you may not know is that the punishment for that sin is death. That may seem extreme to some of us, but, but God, who can't tolerate any, any unholiness, for him, sin is the ultimate pass-fail. And the only way that we can escape death 
is to be forgiven of our sins. And when we talk about forgiveness, we might first think the easy solution is for God just to overlook our sins. I mean, we do that all the time with people. But it, it's, it's more complicated than that. God does not choose to punish sin. God is obligated to do so. Because he is just. And justice demands that evil be punished. So if God's justice forbids him from overlooking our sin, then the, the only way that we can receive forgiveness and not face the punishment that we deserve is for someone to come and stand in our place. Someone to serve as a substitute to receive the punishment that was due us, but taken upon someone else. But the catch is this. That substitute cannot be one who deserves his own punishment. Therefore, that substitute cannot be sinful. Let me plain it like this. If you had a ticket to go see the Rolling Stones in concert, you might be elated. I know Kay Plaster loves the Rolling Stones, so she would be excited about it, okay? But if you lost that ticket, you could not get into the concert. And that would make you sad. Unless you had a friend who came up and said, why don't you take my ticket? And as they, as they handed you the ticket, you might be elated again. But that's only helpful if that person has a legitimate ticket, right? Because they scanned them right there at the venue. And if it's a fake ticket, if it's a, if it's a manufactured one, you don't get in. Jesus the sinless Savior takes our punishment, gives us his ticket to enter into the presence of God, but he can only be our Savior if he was truly sinless. Paul says to the church at Corinth these memorable words, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be a sin offering for our sins so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Our only hope of being forgiven of our sins is in a sinless Jesus. I'm not surprised by Mr. Lemon's comments. I'm sure he's a secularist. He's probably ignorant about the biblical story as you and I know it. He may, be, he may believe that Jesus is a holy man, but probably more man than holy. But his comments do concern me because they were spoken so easily without any hesitation. Because he suggested that everyone knows this to be true. And because the person hearing him make those comments offered no rebuttal to that fact, accepting them equally as true. But I'm most concerned that some Christians who are not well grounded in faith may hear that claim and think it plausible. They may consider that Jesus in his 33 years of living surely had to have spoken back to his parents, surely had to have lifted up a pencil from somebody, surely had to have, have hit his thumb with a hammer and yelled out an expletive. Surely Jesus had to have a desire and a longing that's counter to God's will and satisfies it, but, but maybe even repented of that and did not want to do that any longer. Surely Jesus, in 33 years of living, had to have sinned sometime in that life. And in the process, we stop seeing Jesus as deity living in a human body. He's just now like one of us. And we forget that it was necessary for Jesus to be without sin to free us from ours. The, the sinless Jesus is not a minor point of doctrine. It may sound implausible in our modern world, but Jesus was sinless deity wrapped up in flesh and blood. And only because he was sinless could he suffer death in my place 
and free me from the shackles of sin. Let me say before prayer this morning that I want to thank personally, and I, I'm, I know the elders share this. We are extremely grateful for those on the security team, the COVID advisory team, the worship team, those that are involved in our Wednesday night and weekly study groups, and all of you who are participating and connecting with people throughout the week. That is such an important role that you're playing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to get this across. I failed to mention this last week. Uh, email us with your concerns or celebrations for prayer, okay? I'm sure that we can funnel those to us. I got a chance to see Hannah Lowry. For those of you who knows what she's been going through, she looks terrific. She feels good. She looks good. She has a very positive outlook. And I'm grateful for her attitude and her heart. And Chuck... We hope you're not getting ill. For those of you who might have heard, Chuck was in the presence of somebody who was being tested for COVID-19. So we hope that that uh, turned out to be negative and he'll be up and around uh, with us again shortly and soon. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the way you have given us mercy in this time of real crisis for America. And, and so for the globe, for that matter, all around the world, we pray that you will protect your children. And yet we know, Father, that there will be some who, who will inevitably get sick. We pray for them, for their well-being, for their recovery. Father, we pray for what we do here at Maryland Heights, that we are encouraging and uplifting one another, that we are expressing our love, and that the claim to be family is a true claim, and that we are concerned about each other. I am so grateful, Father, for the men and the women, for the, the lives of the people who attend here, who can continue to, to demonstrate and display their faith in their daily lives. And I ask that you strengthen them, that you give them courage, and you allow them the honor and the privilege to serve you. We're so grateful, God, for all that you have done for us. We pray, Father, for those who are going through some difficult times, some challenges health-wise, perhaps in their families, perhaps in some other way, and, and especially, Father, those who may be struggling spiritually. May the rest of us who feel strong and confident now in our spiritual lives 
be able to lend them a hand and lift them up. And most of all, Father, love them. We pray for those who are going to undergo surgeries. We ask you to be with them and the doctors and nurses and all those who will be serving that patient. And that everything goes well. There will be no repercussions or later infections and that full recovery will take place. For our nation, Father, we pray, we know that there is turmoil. Help us to help to heal the turmoil. Help us to help others to see that there is a healing possible. I just continue to pray, Father, for all of us at Maryland Heights, that throughout this separation, we can feel just as connected as when we're gathered together. And as Scott has indicated, we serve a perfect Savior and a risen Lord. Through his name we pray. Amen.